Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Donald Hentz and Kent Amos, both founders and CEOs of their respective public charter schools. The Dorothy Irene Haidt Community Academy Public Charter School and the Friendship Public Charter School. The two schools were founded separately in 1998 in response to the need for quality education that two social service agencies saw in their communities, and Donald Hentz and Kent Amos have both generously agreed to share some of their experience with us. I'd like to thank you gentlemen for joining us today. Thank, thank you. you. So the charter public school movement is, is a relatively recent development. The movement has had its ups and downs, but in essence, these schools are really crafted to supply, to, to address certain needs in various communities. Could you each talk about the genesis of your schools, how they came to be founded, and the state of the schools today? Friendship uh, was founded out of a social services agency um, that was a 100-year-old organization located on Capitol Hill called Friendship House. And it was from that uh, need to improve education in our community that the organization determined that it would uh, establish a public charter school. Little did we know that it would turn into a multi-campus charter school and that we would end up serving uh, more than 4,000 children in Washington, D.C. 4,000 children in Washington, D.C. And when was the school founded? Our school was founded in 1998. We opened in September 1998. At that time, we were the first multi-campus charter school in the country. We opened with two campuses with 1,300 students and more than 1,000 students on the waiting list. From a standing start to two campuses and 1,000 and students? Yes. And, and from that standing start now, how many campuses? We have six campuses in Washington. We also operate a high school for the District of Columbia public school system, and we operate four schools in Baltimore uh, with over 3,000 students. Astounding, astounding. And Kent Amos? We're a lot more humble than, than his beginnings. <laughs> we, um, we started out, um, candidly, I started out as a father on a mission to save his son. In 1982, I moved back to Washington, D.C. as an executive with a major uh, office products company, namely Xerox. And my wife and I had to make the decision, where do we put our two children in school? And everybody suggested putting them in private schools. You could not possibly send your children to, to public schools with those children. And we kept saying, what do you mean, those children? You know, those children, the ones that wear the baggy pants, that, that don't speak proper English, that this and that, that and that this and the criminals. And, and we said, no, public schools were good enough for us, my wife and I. Public schools were good enough for our parents. Public schools were good enough for my grandparents, all in Washington, D.C. It's good enough for my children. Until he came home with three boys, Darrell, Milton, and T-Bone. And when you bring a boy named T-Bone home, you understand what those children is all about. But the reality of it is those children, as they were called, had hopes and dreams and aspirations and capacity, just as our own son. But we also knew if we didn't do something to influence their lives, they were going to definitely influence our son's life. So we took them in. We said, we'll house you, clothe you, feed you, educate you, do whatever it takes to see to it that you have the same opportunity for a life's outcome as our own two children. Our daughter wasn't the issue. She was in grade school. Our son was the issue. He was in high school. Eleven years after that humble beginning of three boys, my wife and I had taken in 85 children. 85 children. Yeah, we sent 73 to college. Over 60 have graduated, but along that journey, five were murdered, our boys. Three shot, one stabbed, one hung. So here I was, a corporate executive with the kind of resources and power that's available to someone at that level, still losing his children to the violence and senselessness of our society. So I ultimately left my corporate experience and job behind to be a father on a crusade. 
And what I realized then as I do now is that child development is not a, it's not a short thing. It's a very long thing. I tell the story frequently of the last conversation I had with my mother. My father died a year before my mother. And uh, I had taken my mother to the grocery store. She was 87 at the time. And if you go to the grocery store with an 87-year-old lady, she shuffles around the, with the cart, reads everything on every label, and and I'm saying, come on, Mom, let's get this thing going. So anyway, we get home. I unpack her, get everything in the house, and I'm leaving. She says, son, yes, mother, I know I get on your nerves sometime. I said, yes, mother, you do. And today is one of those days. <laughs> you are driving me absolutely crazy. She says, son, I'm trying to help you be the best man you can be. I said, I'm a 57-year-old grandfather. She says, no, you're my baby. That was the last thing my mother ever said to me alive, whatever. So I see children today in my schools, and I'm sure Donald does in his schools and others see in their schools, who don't have that being said to them by their families, that you're my baby and I'm still trying to help you be the best you can be. So we started something called Kids House that we ultimately did in 22 states, serving several thousand kids all over the country. For that period of time, what we called three to nine. It's time to get out of school to the time to go back to school. But the reality of it is it's a 24-7, 365, 20 plus paradigm for over, according to my mother, 57 years. But for reality, <laughs> certainly into the 20s. My youngest now is actually 38, so I understand what she means because <laughs> I have a 46-year-old call me last night and needed some money. So, so I understand what she means. So we started that effort, and when we tried to get into schools, that was under the Urban Family Institute, we couldn't get in. So when this notion of charter schools became available to us, we said, fine, we'll start our own school. So like Donald, out of a social service agency of sorts, not 100 years old, mm -hmm. uh, but one that I also started, the Urban Family Institute, where we believe in, again, covering the full day of a child, we started a school. And again, we started with 275 kids, and now we have a little over 1,700. And un unlike him, we started on one campus, and now we also have uh, five campuses. So we're a multi-campus environment as well. Talk about how you started those initial meetings in which you were sitting down, each of you, uh, and trying to figure out how you were going to bring something small, probably far more modest than what you, what you uh, eventually accomplished, to fruition. I think uh, the one thing you, you have to think about uh, more than anything else is entrepreneurship is no different whether you're talking about entrepreneurship in terms of building a for-profit corporation or you're talking about building a non-profit corporation. Uh, it takes <clears throat> one's ability to, to uh, take an idea work through the most difficult aspects of idea of that idea and to, to carry it to fruition. You take the ups, you take the downs, but more than anything else, you are driving for results. So there's absolutely no difference uh, except at the end, uh, you know, the money goes back into the organization as opposed to dividing it up for profit. There's no difference whatsoever. So there's a return on investment. The result is not necessarily a monetary, monetary result. result. It is an impact on, on children, on families, on communities. I, th I think partially that's the case. But a really good nonprofit organization is an organization that also is in the black. It's not an organization that, that's constantly uh, struggling uh, to survive because it has mismanaged its resources. Right. So uh, uh, managing of, of resources is critical also. Donald's right. Unless you really come to grips early on in the game that you're first and foremost running a business and there's certain principles you must operate in that context. And, and Donald is right. You have to have excess revenue. You know, and that's profit on one level and something else on another. But the reality of it is you must run it like a business.
You have to have an HR function that deal, does the things that HR functions do. Select proper personnel, have the right kind of evaluative systems, all the things that go with it. You must, in fact, have a good business operation. In other words, somebody's managing the funds that come in. Uh, and, of course, the product here is, again, children and families moving forward. One of the things that's critical, critical about this, this type of business that the two of us happen to be in is that product and how you define what you expect out of that. And, and one of the things that there's you know, mixed views on uh, is that it's only about test scores. We don't believe that at CAPS. Uh, we certainly believe in accountability. I'm willing to be held accountable. But I think there's more to it. If you look at how schools are accredited, and under the District of Columbia law, we are required to be accredited within five years. Well, the accrediting agency that we use in this part of the country uh, is the Middle States Association. Right. Well, we're a Middle States accredited, accredited school. There are 12 evaluative processes that you have to go through in order to be properly accredited, mm -hmm. whereas our local agency uses one, test scores. Th there's a big difference between 12 and one. We try to look at all 12 of those on a regular basis, and maybe our test scores aren't as great as some other schools. But we're doing a lot of things. We're the, we're the, we provide education to the, to the highest population of, of homeless children in the city. There's something about that. We have one of the higher percentages of special needs children in our schools. There's something about that. They, they gave uh, one of our colleagues in the, in the charter movement in D.C. a pass, so to speak, on their test scores. And when you look at the number of students they have uh, who are special needs, it's somewhere around 150, 160. Well, we have close to 200. But because we have 1,700 kids and Donald is in the same situation, you know, he has more than I do, but he also has 4,000 kids. Yeah. So the impact on that is never credited anywhere. Right. But it should be to be properly evaluated. So we take all children as they are and do whatever it takes to see to it to have an opportunity to succeed. Well, you're both raising a very interesting question in terms of what is the return on investment. The, the point that, that you're both making is that it's not unitary. It's not one thing. And you can't just shoot for one thing. That is perhaps a distinguishing feature of the nonprofit uh, environment, particularly the educational environment, particularly the education for, for young people, um, that environment in which we live. It's not just one thing. It's not like... Um, shareholder value or profit or all the other euphemisms thereof, it is multidimensional. And if you just shoot for one thing, you, you may be missing the entire mark. But if, in, if in fact uh, you, you look at, at all of the things that an organization like Friendship House would be doing, our whole notion was in, to build uh, communities. And so education was just one aspect of building community. If you look anywhere in the world and say, well, what does a good community look like? A good community has three things in it. Good housing, good jobs, good schools. Absent any one of those three, you do not have a good community and you will not have a good community. And so we were about trying to do that aspect of community building that we thought we were most capable of doing. And in, in taking that challenge, you also have all of the other things that a child might come to the door with. And you don't have the luxury of excluding the child's out of school life from what happens to that child in school or what happens with that child. Or picking the child that, that you uh, will have to deal with. That's absolutely Or the family right. absolutely that you will correct. have to deal with. Uh, in Washington, charter schools are required by law to accept any child who comes and registers and there's a place for that child. That's the law. They are of age, they, they get a seat. Yes. When you think about business, no business has to deal with this type of a situation because what you need to do from an operations point of view to address the, the kinds of needs of a child at the high end of the learning curve and a child at the, at the lower end of the learning curve are substantially different. How do you set up your organization to be operationally tight 
yet still be expansive enough to meet these diverse needs without just becoming sort of a random, interrupt-driven, completely insane um, mess. Well, for, for us, you start out uh, by uh, talking about what your mission is, and our mission is to educate the whole child. So we are totally uninterested in excluding someone. It, it's not in our makeup, it's what we do. And so with that being the case, we will look at what the skill sets are, we will work with those skill sets and see how far can we move this child. Our goal, to be quite honest with you, is to move all of our kids to where they can graduate from college. I didn't say high school. I didn't say junior college. From college. I mean college. That's exactly what I mean. I think over the years. So you're reaching, uh, you're reaching for the mountaintop. We are. Absolutely. Because we want our kids to be productive citizens who contribute actively to their communities. You cannot do this if you don't have the skill sets to compete in today's society. For that, it requires a college degree. Let me take another little angle on what I thought you were asking uh, in your question. I agree certainly with what Donald just said. We didn't start out with a small idea. We started out with the idea that uh, in our charter, uh, as Donald knows, the city has a requirement uh, under law to create this charter, which is basically a contract, a written contract mm -hmm. between the institu institution and the city. Right. Uh, our charter has in it more children than he has. So my charter says I can have up to 5,000 kids. You're now, he, busy. We haven't gotten there yet, <laughs> but, but we thought big. It's a work in point. progress. It's a work in progress. We also have the ability to have nine campuses. We only have five. So we thought big from the beginning. Now, having said that, there is a reality <laughs> that, says, that does set in. And uh, one of the other things, one of my guiding principles early on in the game was, that you gotta be, always have, this is a business proposition, you always have to have a pay for. You gotta be able to pay for it. Right. And having gone through the experience of, of the Urban Family Institute, where you had to raise monies on a regular basis to survive, mm -hmm. I never wanted to get in that situation Absolutely. where if I didn't raise X number of dollars, the children would be impacted. So I said early on, we will not raise money. We'll operate 100% within the framework of what we get through our per pupil applications and other federal and state dollars. But at the same time, I don't want us to be uh, so uh, bent on discussing uh, the business aspect of what charter schools are about that we uh, forget actually what we do. Because at seven o'clock, every morning uh, our school doors open at nine o'clock at night our school doors close and somewhere in that huge period of time we feed kids many of them three meals a day uh, many of them three meals a day and a snack many of them we provide their only exercise for that day for many of them, we might even have to supply them with the uniforms that they wear to school. We might have to supply them with the bus tokens that they use to get to and from school. As well, we have to provide an education. That is an immense task, and it goes far beyond whether our organization functions as a business or not. It's critical that the underbelly of the organization work so that the actual mission of the school can actually be um, uh, achieved. And so that's really why the business aspect is, is so necessary that it's run well because the responsibilities are huge. If you think about it, you're, you're, you have a child's life in your hands. In your hand. They're totally dependent on you. Too many of our children come from home environments where th there's not a lot of parental support. There may be no parental support. 
they may indeed be homeless. But you're still responsible for doing the very best you can for them. And to, to give you an example of they may be homeless, I have a young man who attended my high school. He was, he was homeless in high school. Well, he's working for Goldman Sachs now, so you can call it any way you want to. He works for Goldman Sachs. That's something to look, look at. Yeah, and, and, and Donald's right again. We, we feed million meals a year. We, we, we clothe yeah. both uniforms and non-uniforms. Yeah. We, we provide transportation, buses and bus tokens and passes for subways. We, everything Donald says, we do. We all do, not just the yes. two of us, but that's part of the, I suspect that's part of the, what everybody does. But Donald's also right that we have to make sure we remember why we're there to develop the child's capacity to com be competitive on the world stage. Part of that is academics, but part of that is a self-esteem issue. Part of that is a view mm -hmm. of the world that's bigger than self. Uh, so there's a lot of aspects to what that final product looks like. And uh, Donald knows that I, I have a, a bias about not everything being skewed to a single test. I think that's, that's an inappropriate way of looking at the value the value of a child, the value of a child's education. Not that I believe in any way, shape, or form that they shouldn't progress academically. Right. Because I am not saying that, I would never say that. But there are other aspects of their developmental experience, particularly when they come from challenged experiences in the first place, that also have to be moved along continuously. Yes. Uh, so uh, we never forget, we never can forget, we can't, we're not allowed to forget, we can't forget the fact that our job is to see to it that a child develops to one who can compete on the world stage. And, and the best type of infrastructure is the infrastructure that to the child is completely invisible, that they enter into that school at seven o'clock and they enter into their community with their friends, with their teachers, um, into a different mindset, uh, feeling safe, uh, feeling the joy of learning, because if you're going to uh, be a lifelong learner, there needs to be joy. Well, I think uh, you have really hit the nail on the head when you say uh, joy, uh, because what, uh, what you're hoping to do is that you are attempting to make uh, your student's life as close as possible to the student's life who comes from an upper middle class or reasonably wealthy household. And, and I say that, that means that, that they can get uh, good food, they can get exercise, that there are extracurricular activities. At, at my school, for instance, um, we do things like send our entire school on college tours. And we don't ask them to pay to go, we budget for this. Uh, we send our, our kids on foreign experiences. Uh, it is a part of what we do for our, our high school kids. We are, uh, one of our high school groups, the environmental class, is on the way to Costa Rica. Um, this is an exceptional opportunity um, for a group of young people to go and, and do environmental studies. This is the kind of thing that is hugely important because it sets a, a path for a kid who may have no vision of the world to see things that, that are spectacular, that are life-changing, um, that may be altering their whole view of what they can do in life. That's what you're attempting to do. Kids coming from a situation where hope may not necessarily be there, and you're showing them it is possible. In terms of, of the teachers and, and, and how the teachers interact with the students, as teachers all over the world, um, they, they play a mentoring part, a friendship part, a formal teacher role. Um, they act as, as parent surrogates. They act as advisors. Um, how do you attract great teachers to, um, to create the atmosphere, the learning atmosphere? 
And whether it's in the arts or in your sports programs or in your various academic programs, uh, how do you create that, that sense that your school is where a teacher will have their best experience? For us, it's our HR function. We have an excellent, excellent HR function. And we have high expectations of our staff, and we make that clear. So sometimes people want to hear that in the interview process. They want to know that you want the best out of them uh, going into the interview. So we do that. We also, uh, we spent, both of us again, have spent uh, millions of dollars in giving our staffs a, a place to, to work that they feel good in, they feel safe in, they feel good about. You talk about the children. Staff have to feel the that pride. too. Yeah. So we have renovated all of our facilities. We don't have any what would be considered to, 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 to typical public school buildings. So workplace ergonomics is, is something that you pay attention to. It's, it's, it's how people feel within that environment. It's how functional the environment is to the purpose to which it is placed. It's the idea of uh, even such things as, as colors, what the ch you know, how the chairs uh, function, how the desks function. You're smiling. I guess you've been paying attention to these things. We just we opened up another conference room in, in, the, in the administration building, and the chairs literally were put in today, and they were red. And everybody was running to my office, you bought red chairs? Yeah, I bought red chairs. And, and they're beautiful. And everybody you know, feels good about them. And, they, and we have yellows and we have greens. And one of the buildings has green chairs, another one has purple chairs in it. Somebody once said to me, if, if a school looks like uh, a jail, what do you think you're preparing people for? That's exactly you know? right. Um, I think we feel the same way about the quality of the environment. Uh, for me, uh, believe it or not, it has to do with shiny floors. Mm -hmm. And um, for, for our, our maintenance staff, um, they will tell you that if I can't see my face on the floor, then someone had better be working real hard. Uh, but what you are simply doing is telling kids that you respect them. That's right. That, and because what you are, are changing is their view of what school can and should be like. School should not be dreary with green smoke-filled walls, but it's a bright and cheerful and welcoming place. Uh, you also are telling the teachers you hire and that you respect the work that they will have to do because you're putting them in a comfortable, light-filled environment. This is all important for both perception and reality. So there's also a cultural uh, piece in here where you were talking about your maintenance staff having adopted the value of having that shiny floor. There is a subterranean message here that is communicated to, to everyone um, so that you, you're, you're creating common values. Common values become self-reinforcing and then they, they permeate back into the family and back into that child's life. Is this a, uh, a type of thinking that, um, that you instituted um, systematically and, and by intent by communicating these values in particular uh, ways? Um, how, how, did you, how did you engender that, that for, idea? For us, we believe that everybody, every adult in the building is a teacher. And so what you are doing, you're incorporating the maintenance staff, you're incorporating the food service staff, you might be incorporating the security guards. Mm -hmm. They're helping you maintain order, they're helping you teach children. If you're in cafeteria, you need to know how to behave in that setting. If you're in the hallway, you need to know how to behave in that setting. You certainly need to know not how not to destroy property if you're, if you're in a school. Everyone can help in some way help that school be a better place. Uh, what, is the, what is the direction for your schools going into the future? Is this a matter now of, of scale um, and continuing to scale? Is it uh, to continue to improve the services to the children and families that you serve? For us, uh, I think um, we have grown as, as large as we want to be. Uh, but more importantly, um, we are hell-bent 
on trying to serve kids who are not being served now in the District of Columbia. And believe it or not, uh, you still have a huge percentage of kids who are in poor schools and poor environments. And there was a, an article just recently in the local newspaper <clears throat> that I think uh, says a lot. If you subtract the test scores of all of the schools in the more affluent ward three in the District of Columbia, then charter schools test scores are 30% higher serving poor children. Hmm. So something is there. It, it's easy to disqualify two or three percentage points. Right. It's extremely difficult to ignore 30. And so if in fact what we do allows us to better educate poor children, then we need to be allowed to educate those children. And that was the, the goal of the charter movement. Um, it, it, this all really came from the early thinking of Milton Friedman. And, and when you, you think about it, it was about uh, really a, a type of, of uh, perfect competition, that there would be numerous uh, quote unquote small organizations. So you're saying there would be numerous schools, many of them having different purposes, different goals, different objectives, so that you could actually serve children. Who is it that should be making the decision that all schools should look alike? Who is that person that should be making the determination what my child ought to be doing. Not a parent who has a child who has a particular passion. Well, well he, there's another aspect to, to this process that, that, that all folks have to be concerned about. All charter schools are under some kind of authority. Right. Of course. And those authorities have their own view of the world. And, and I'm not suggesting they don't have a, their own positive view. It's just, it's just a different view than, than maybe I do or Donald does or people over at William Door. But because of their role, they're able to impose their will right. on us. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's not what this was designed to be. Now you asked about where we're going in the future. Um, and is there any scaling in the future? Well, we, we do have some desires. I started, like I told you, we, we plan to have 5,000 kids and we're chasing Donald, which we'll never catch up. Because uh, I told you I'm getting old, so I can't catch, but can't run but so fast anymore. But the reality of it is, Tomorrow has to look different than today. You, you talk about Milt Friedman. There's another man who's, who's on the stage today who is very widely quoted and widely viewed named Ken Robinson, whose yes. views on education are, are one of the, he's becoming our guru. He, we're looking at what Ken Robinson is saying about how we have to educate our children uh, for tomorrow. And it's dramatically different than what it is today. Tomorrow's children may never see a classroom and may right. be educated the entire life in, in, in different kinds of physical environments, let alone technological environments. And we've got to get ready for that. And, and how do we bring that forward? Uh, we can't exclude what's going on in the, technical, te the technology world as it applies to education. We have one of the few, actually, they're the only online school in the city. We have 120 kids online. Hmm. And we've been doing that for nine years. So we know a little bit about that. And that's going to, right now, it's only 120 out of 1,700. So it's a small percentage. But if, you, if we're sitting here 15 years from now, if that percentage is still the same, we have done something wrong. We have to change that. That's a reality. Uh, so, of course, I'd be 85. I don't want to be sitting here either. But that's another <laughs> story. But, but the point I'm making is we are looking literally right now in a one-year process that's already begun, led by three members of our, our board who are educators, uh, one whom was, whom was, a, was, the, was the chief educator for the state of New York is on our board, and uh, he was 
principal of the year in the nation. On, he's the same man on our board. We have a man who runs uh, child development at the University of District of Columbia. We have a, a young lady who is on the board at National Cathedral School. So we have three top-notch educators mm -hmm. leading this charge. And we're joined by a woman who is a principal of the largest high school in, in Montgomery, in, in, in Prince George's County. Uh, she's not a part of our board, but she's volunteered to be a part of our education development strategy for the next 15 years. And I will sit here and say to anybody, I'm not sure what it's gonna look like uh, at the end of this year, but what I do know it is, it will not look like what it looks like now. And you're both arguing for innovation and the freedom to innovate. Freedom to innovate. Freedom to innovate. Entrepreneur, entrepreneurship and yes. the freedom to uh, be entrepreneurs. Yes. You're arguing that for every complex problem, there is a simple answer and it's wrong. Templates are, f are easy to implement and they can be boxes. And if you really believe in innovation and entrepreneurship, then there's a certain amount of freedom, freedom to experiment, freedom to drive, freedom to lead that is required. And that was the spirit in which the, uh, the public charter schools were founded. And, and you're arguing for Absolutely. a continuation of that, uh, that spirit. I Absolutely. think it, really that, that whole notion uh, speaks for itself. When you think of where great things happen, where do great innovations take place? They take place where there is a spirit of freedom. Innovation rarely takes place if it's squashed and stomped on. Uh, you have to have uh, the, the freedom to innovate, the, th the freedom to dream, the freedom to do. The, uh, the important thing is that uh, at the end of the day, your kids are doing well. That's it. Uh, it. Nothing is more satisfying than someone coming back. We now have six kids who graduated from our high school who are back teaching in our schools. I don't think of anything that could be better. One, you made it through school, you made it through our very strenuous interview process, but you decided to come home. come home. And you thought well enough of how we treated you as a student that you would come back here as an adult. We have a young lady who uh, went through Teach for America and said, well, I want to go back to my own high school. Um, I find that to be tremendous. And we have one, and we don't have six, we have one that came out of us who now t works for us. But uh, in an extension of that, and I'm sure Donald's in the same situation, Friendship is in the same way, I know of at least five children who are students in our school who are children of students who have been in our schools. Like that. So that to me is as is great a statement as the ones who come back to work with us. But they're now beginning to bring their children back here. You talk, and I, this is one that this proud papa is, is proud of. Uh, the Gates Foundation created this, this scholarship several years ago where they selected these winners who got full rides for as long as it takes to finish. The first one awarded in the District of Columbia, a child coming out of a banneker, a young lady, was one of our students. We also had a child last year in the seventh grade, seventh grade, who got 100% on the DC cast. No, I'll take that. She didn't get a single wrong answer. It's amazing. At a school where everybody says they should lock everybody up and, and throw them away. It's just, it, never mind, don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, these are inspiring, inspiring examples of what can be done with determination, innovation, grit, a uh, little bit of business savvy, I think, can be thrown in there, and, and a lot of entrepreneurship. Donald Hens, Kent Amos, thank you so much for doing what you're doing. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it's, it. It really is well a done. pleasure. Thank you, man. Always.